we all cry out to God at different times for different reasons, different places. Like Ray was sharing, you know, he was ill recently, so he's been crying out to God, God, I'm feeling terrible. Please come and help me. Please come and restore my soul. Other of us, others of us may have gone through bereavement. Other of us, others of us may have gone through other troubled times. And when those times come, we should cry out to God. God is there for us, and he wants to hear us. So today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Release International, what the ministry is, what it does. And then we're going to look briefly at the, some of the Israelites from that Bible passage. And then we're going to look at our brothers and sisters around the world today, how they cry out to God, and how God answers them. Okay? So, who we are. Release International is a Christian charity that is called by God to love and serve persecuted Christians. That is what we are about. That is what we stand for. We were founded in 1968, inspired by the testimony of Pastor Richard Wormbrand, who was imprisoned for his faith for 14 years. And today, we work through local partners in around 30 countries around the world to love and support persecuted Christians. And we do that prayerfully, pastorally, and practically. And we want Christians in the UK to join in with this ministry of supporting our persecuted family. We're calling Christians in the UK into fellowship with them so that we can support them and so that we can learn lessons of discipleship with them. Now, going back to the, the passage that we read earlier from Exodus, we're going to look at a little bit about the background for what has gone on in the lead up to this. And what we want to do at Release International and in our church in the UK is to have a biblical understanding of persecution. We want to understand what does the Bible say about persecution and how does that apply to your life today and to my life? How does it apply? Because the word of God isn't just something that we read and think, oh, that's nice, isn't it? We read it and it applies to our life. It's transformative. It transforms the way we think, the way we speak, and the way we act. So the background to this, remember we read in, in chapter 1 and verse 6, Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. So you probably know the story of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. Um, him and his family went down to leave in Egypt because there was a huge famine across the land. They lived there. Joseph became prime minister. He was ruling over the land. Just Pharaoh was, was higher than him, but everyone else was underneath him. He was in charge. And his family came to live there as well. And they multiplied. They had children. And this group of people, the Jewish people, were called the Israelites. Now, the Israelites multiplied, and they multiplied. And the generation of Joseph passed on. He died. His family died. But the Israelites carried on living there. And what do we see in verse 7? But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. Okay, you can imagine it, can't you? They've moved down. There's, I think there was about 70-odd of them who'd moved down to Egypt, and now they've grown into a nation. God has blessed them to grow into a nation. And then what happens? In verse 8, we read this. Then a new king, who did not know about Joseph. He obviously hadn't read his history books. He hadn't looked up the previous Pharaoh's uh, diaries. Dear diary, Joseph came down to Egypt today. He needed to check his history books, didn't he? But a new king arose. He didn't know about Joseph. He came, in, he came to power in Egypt. And this is what he says. Look, he said to his people, to the Egyptians, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we uh, will join our enemies, fight against us, 
and leave the country. So we see that the new pharaoh, the new guy who's in charge, he doesn't know the history, he hasn't looked at it, and he wants to deal with the Israelites. He wants to make sure they are removed. He's scared of them, to, to be honest. He's thinking, if we don't deal with these people, they could rise up, they could overthrow us. They could even join forces with our neighboring enemies and overthrow us completely. Pharaoh is scared of the Israelites. He's, he's king in his own country, but he's scared of the people who are there. And what do we see in chapter 2 and verse 23? During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery. The Israelites had been put into slavery. And while they were there, they started growing, groaning out to God. They started crying out to God. God, where are you? Where are you? Why are you letting me go through this? Why are you letting your nation, the Israelites, go through this? It's interesting that Pharaoh portrays the Israelites as a dangerous minority who are becoming too strong for their own good. He picks on their otherness and assumes the worst of them. We know that the Israelites were not planning to overthrow the Egyptians. They wanted to live and God would bless them. But Pharaoh didn't understand this. And this had disastrous consequences for God's people. Pharaoh made them work as slaves. And can you imagine what this is, might have felt like for the people of God? Waking up every day to face the burden of hatred and slavery. They were broken down. They were oppressed. There was no representation for them. They didn't have a vote. There was no prospects for the future. Now fast forward a few thousand years and we are here today in 2024. And interestingly, the situation around the world hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Because at the root of it is our hostility towards God. See, the root of it is our heart. Our hearts are hostile towards God, towards Jesus. And what Jesus came to do is to bring new life, to bring regeneration to our souls so that we would turn to Jesus. And today, what do we see today? In the, you've all got a copy of today's Voice magazine. It's the April to June edition. These are all free. But I'm just going to read out one of, the, one of the stories that we have in here, which is on page six. For Christians in the UK, traveling to and from church on a Sunday morning may be fraught. Getting a young family ready in time for a service has always has had its challenges. But we rarely, if ever, encounter hostility on our journey. You know, did any of us encounter any particular hostility on the way to church today? Maybe a dog along the street might have barked at you. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it was quite uneventful coming to church today, probably. Now, Pastor Rajendra wasn't expecting trouble either, as he walked home from leading a service at his small church in a rural village in Rajasthan. But suddenly, he found himself surrounded by a gang of eight men, attacking him with swords, axes, and metal rods. It's horrific, isn't it? It's evil. They beat him severely and left him for dead, lying bleeding in the road not far from his house. Rajendra was saved by someone who found him and took him to hospital, where he required treatment for 40 days. The gang who attacked him were not robbers, but Hindu fanatics, who wanted to drive him, his small church, and all traces of Christianity out of their village. Thanks to Release International's partner in India, Rajendra received extensive physiotherapy after his hospital treatment and a motorbike to aid his mobility, especially to and from the hilly surrounding villages. Now that attack was eight years ago, but he suffers pain in his legs even now. 
He's also still ministering in the same village, and sometimes he sees some of the men who attacked them. He forgave them, and so the police case against them was dropped. He says they leave him alone now, but he prays that one day they will come to faith and understand the forgiving love of Christ. What an amazing testimony this man has. Yes, he was attacked. He was attacked for his faith in Christ. But how does he respond? He responds in love and forgiveness, and he prays for them. He prays that they will be saved because, ladies and gentlemen, this life here, this is not everything, is it? We know that, don't we? This is not the end and be all. God has saved our souls for eternity. Now, the, our bodies, we are getting older, aren't we? We are getting frailer. These bodies are weak, but our souls are eternal because God has saved us. And this pastor Rajendra, he knows that. He knows the love of God in his heart. And even though he was beaten, even though he was oppressed, his response was to love them, to love the attackers, to pray for them. Amazing. Now let's go back to uh, the Israelites who were crying out for help. Oh. Verse 23 in chapter 2 says that the people of Israel groaned in their slavery. They were in pain and they were in despair and their suffering caused them to groan. But that's not all they did. They also cried out to God. They didn't stay in their groaning thinking, oh no, nothing's going to change. No, they cried out to God, didn't they? They cried out to God and asked for his help. And groaning in these kind of circumstances is perfectly natural and normal and understandable. But groaning by itself is not a positive response. When we face trials, we shouldn't just mope around thinking, oh no, woe is me, I'm going through such a bad time. Yes, we recognize the bad time, but let's turn it to God. Let's cry out to God. And then it becomes a prayer. Then our groaning becomes a prayer to God. And prayer changes things. And you know what, as Ray was sharing today, it's so important, isn't it, to know that Prayer changes things. You've been praying faithfully for well over 20 years for people around the world. I'm sure other people ha here have too. And the difficult thing is where we don't see a response, where we don't see God answer our prayers how we want them answered. That's very difficult and that's very challenging. And the passage that you shared was spot on that we need to be persistent in our prayers and we need to have faith in the God who can move and who can act. We need to have that faith and it is God who can give us that faith. We can pray, God, I'm really lacking in faith right now. I really don't believe this situation is going to change. Please come and change me. And what God does is he comes. He changes us. He renews our faith so that we can carry on praying. And how does God respond to the Israelites? How does he respond to their groaning, to them crying out to him? Well, first of all, God heard their groaning. Everyone turn to your neighbor and say, God heard. God heard. That's right. Now, of course, God already knew about their suffering, didn't he? He's not, it didn't come up to him as a prayer and he was like, oh, oh, something bad is happening down there. Oh, I didn't know that was going on. No, of course not. He knew what was already going on. So when this comes up to him, when the prayers come up to him, he already knows what is going on. But there's something strange about prayer. I don't know the, the complete intricacies of it, but God responds when his children pray. God responds when you pray. God hears your prayers. The prayers that you say in church, the prayers that you say at home, the prayers that you even say in your heart that no one else has heard. God hears those prayers. And God is listening. 
God wants us to tell him about our suffering, about our struggles. The people that we support today, God wants to listen to them, and God is listening. God hears the cry of help from his people, and God hears your cry of help as well. Secondly, God remembered his covenant, didn't he? And what does it say in verse 24? God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. Everyone turn to your neighbor again and say, God remembered. God remembered. That's right. This is important to know, people. God remembered. He Again, it's not like he forgot. It's not like... He opened his Holy Bible and turned back to, to Genesis 12 and thought, oh, yes, that's right. I made a covenant with Abraham, didn't I? God, no, he didn't forget. He didn't forget. Now, this is telling us that despite the oppression from Pharaoh, despite the situation that was going on, the from a human perspective, it's an impossible situation, isn't it? It's quite impossible. Despite all of that, the Bible is telling us this to remind us that even though the situation might seem impossible, God has got other plans. Amen? God has got other plans. God remembers his promises that he made and he will keep them. God is faithful to all of his promises. God is faithful to keep all of of his promises. We sang that wonderful hymn earlier, taken straight from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters that whatever we are going through, we can cry out to God. He hears us. He remembers his promises to us. And one of those promises is never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Whatever you are going through today and in your life right now, God is hearing your groans. God is hearing you cry out to him. And God is remembering his promises that he made to you, which is never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And God is remembering his promises for the Israelites here. He remembers his covenant that he made and it's a promise. And when these people cried out to God, God remembered. And then what did God do? After, after that, he's um, God heard their groaning. Uh, he remembered his covenant with them. And so what, what was God's response? So God looked on the Israelites. Turn to your neighbor and say, God looked. God looked. That's right. God looked. God looked on the Israelites. He wasn't up there in heaven thinking, ah, I've got better things to do with my time. I've got a whole universe to run. No, God looked on his people, his dearly beloved chosen people, the Israelites, the Jews. He looked on them. And when you cry out to God, he is not distant. He might feel distant. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes God does feel distant distant but the truth is the reality is he is very close and God looks on you when you cry out to God God looks on you he observes you he takes note of what is going on Do you know there's no such thing as a miscarriage with justice with God because he's got all of the evidence he knows everything he knows everyone's thoughts, everyone's actions, the actions that we've done in secret, the actions that we've done in public. He knows everything. And because he is good, because he is just and fair, there is no miscarriage of justice with him. And that gives us great confidence and hope when we take things to him, when we cry out to God, because we know that he is going to be just. He is going to be fair. And he is going to act on our behalf. And when we cry out to God for people like Rajendra and other Christians who are being persecuted for their faith, we know with certainty that God is going to act. 
because of who God is. Not because of you or me, but because of who God is. God is just, God is fair, and God will act because God loves justice. He is a God of justice. That is so clear throughout the Bible. He is passionate about justice, about people being treated fairly. But not only does God hear our groaning, not only does God remember the promises that he has made to us, not only does he then look and observe and see everything that's going on, but what's he do? He is concerned. So turn to your neighbor one last time and say, God is concerned. God is concerned. This is more than just being aware. In the Hebrew word, it implies an intimate knowledge. It means that God was closely concerned about his people's suffering, and he was deeply moved by it. You could almost say he felt the pain himself. When God's people cry out to him, he hears, he remembers his covenant, he looks, and he is deeply concerned. And whatever things that you are facing today or this week, you can know and you are rest assured that he is deeply concerned about your situation. None of our situations are too trivial for him. And none of our situations are too big for him to handle. What do we need to do? We need to groan. We need to cry out to God because he is the one who is able to come and minister to us and help us and meet our every need. What did the Israelites do? They cried out to God. They said, God, come and help us. We're, we're slaves here in this land. We need you. And what did God do? God sent someone along, didn't he? God sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And today, our brothers and sisters around the world who are undergoing immense oppression and persecution, they are also crying out to God. And you can continue to read their stories in the magazine. They are crying out to God. And you have an amazing privilege of being able to stand in the gap for them. You've got the throne of God over here, and you've got Christians who are being persecuted over here. And what does the Bible say? We can come to the throne with boldness and confidence, knowing that he hears us. So as I read about Pastor Rajendra, I can think, this is a really tough situation. I can't do anything to change that situation, but I know the person who can. I can now come with confidence into the throne room of God and say, Jesus, please help Pastor Rajendra. He is struggling. He's in physical pain. He's in emotional pain. And you are the one who is able to make a difference. You are the one who can transform his life. You are the one who can save the people that he's praying for. And right now, I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with him and pray myself for those people that he is praying for. I'm going to pray as well for that, their salvation. And what a wonderful opportunity you have. Was it Tuesday evening, your prayer meeting? Wonderful opportunity, Tuesday evening, if you're free, to be here, to pray, to intercede, to come before the throne of God, the throne of God Almighty who created all things by his word. Wow. You know, just, just understanding who God is blows my mind. It, we can't understand who he is because he's so great. But when we recognize just how great God is, that will help stir our hearts to pray for our brothers and sisters, to stir our hearts to intercede for them. The Israelites... They cried out to God, God heard them, and God answered. Our brothers and sisters around the world today, they are crying out to God, and God hears them, and God is answering. Whether we see it or not, God is answering. When you cry out to God, whatever it is you're going through, God is listening, God is observing, and God is answering. God is answering your prayers, everyone. That is truth. 
okay? And right now, you might be going through, through something that's very tough. I don't know your personal situations, but I promise you this, God is listening, and God is answering your prayers, okay? God is answering your prayers. So take courage and keep hanging on to faith in Jesus. So the question then is, what can we do? How can we respond to this? You know, we're living here in the UK. How can I respond? What can I do that's actually going to make a difference to our persecuted family? Well, first of all, stay in touch on your seat. You will see a stay in touch card. And you'll also have a copy of The Voice magazine. This magazine is a free magazine, okay? We don't want to put any hindrances in anybody's way to be able to get this information, which is why we're giving them out for free. They have always been free and they will always be free. They come out quarterly. If you want to receive this for you to come straight into your letterbox, just fill out this Stay In Touch card and give it to me before you go, okay? We'll sign you up for the magazine and you can get it digitally or as a physical copy. I get mine as a physical copy because I know I get too many emails. If I get it as an email, I'm not going to read it. If I get a physical copy, I will read it, which is why I ask for a physical copy. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you need a physical copy too. Um, but we've got plenty of them here as well if you want to give them out to your friends as well. So the first thing you can do is to sign up. And we have a special offer today. If you sign up today to the magazine, you can choose one of these books or this DVD to have for free. I have read both of these books and I have seen this film and I can recommend any of them to you. They are all very good, very challenging. Personally, I prefer books. It takes time to read, time to flesh out a story. And both of these are very challenging to your faith, okay? Now, as a teenager, I hadn't read much of the Bible and someone at church said to me, oh, have you read the book of Acts? I was thinking, no, not really. In my mind, I'm thinking, that sounds boring. I don't want to read Acts. I'd rather play my computer games. Thank you very much. But he challenged me. He said, Andrew, go and read the book of Acts. So I thought, okay, I've got nothing to lose, I guess. I went and read it. Wow. What an amazing story. That's like a huge adventure story right there. I was thinking, wow, God is moving. God is building his church. There's perse yes, there's persecution going on. But look at what God is doing. God is healing the sick. God is transforming lives. God is building his church. And as I read the book of Acts, I was thinking, how did I not know about this before? And as I read these two books in the past few years, I had the same experience of what God is doing in the church today. I mean, this was written recently, but it happened in 2015, which is much more recent. Uh, Torture for Christ is the book about Pastor Richard Wormbrand that Release International was founded on. Um, he, again, I, I mentioned he was a pastor in Romania, uh, put in prison for his faith for 14 years. Uh, but please do so give me one of these cards and you can get one of those for free today. That is not a problem. And the other way you can get involved if you want to is to give. I know you as a church are a generous church. You as a church already give and already sow into the work of Release International. And we are truly, truly grateful for that. So if God is stirring your heart today to give, and it's important, isn't it, that we know that God is stirring our hearts because there's so many We want to be honoring to God with our money, honoring to God with what he has given to us. If God has spoken to you today, and if you want to give, then please do. Uh, you can scan the QR code there, or you can go onto our website to give. And lastly, I mean, I'm seeing this as the, my volunteering manager hat now. If you want to volunteer with us, you know, Ray is doing an amazing job. Thank you, Ray, so much for raising the flag of our persecuted brothers and sisters, you know, when I heard that you'd been, you started that prayer meeting 20 years ago and it's still going, that is very impressive and grateful to you and really grateful to God for his faithfulness in keeping that going. Uh, but we're also looking for fundraisers. So fundraising is your thing, or if you're not really into fundraising, but you'd like to give it a go, 
We've got lots of these books over there. These are free. And they are called an A to Z of fundraising. And they have 26, because 26 ideas, because A to Z, 26 letters in the alphabet. Yep, thank you. Um, 26 ideas of what you can do for fundraising. Fundraising isn't all about cake sales, although they are, they work really well. Fundraising isn't all about going for long hikes or marathons, although they are good as well. We had one guy a couple of years ago who decided, he thought, I want to fundraise for Release International. I'm not sure what I want to do. I don't like baking. I don't like running. What can I do? Now, he's a guy who goes to a gym. So we thought, you know what? I'm going to team up with my friends and we're going to bench press together. We're going to bench press for Release International. And together, they bench press the weight of a blue whale. <laughs> Now, I love that because it's thinking outside the box. What are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? And how can you use that to benefit the kingdom of God? How can you use that to benefit the kingdom of God, to raise funds for our beloved brothers and sisters? The last book I would like to mention is Brother, I Have Come to Arrest You which is by, it's a story of uh, Dr. Bahani. He's one of the trustees of Release International. This is his story. He's from Eritrea. He was imprisoned for his faith. He's now uh, living in the UK. But his passion is to see Christians who are persecuted for their faith, especially in Eritrea. His passion is to see them supported, prayed for, and set free from the prisons. There are so many Christians today who are in prison for their faith. Now I'm going to close in prayer, but there's many different ways that we can get involved. If you want to sign up to the magazine, then please do. If you'd like to fundraise, then please do. Uh, I'm going to be over by the, the, the table over there afterwards. Please come and chat to me about, about any of these things, and I'd love to speak with you. Uh, but let me just close in, in, a, in a word of prayer. Father God, Thank you so much that you are a God who is very much concerned about our situations. Thank you that you are not a distant God, but you are very much have an intimate knowledge and you are very much present with us through everything that we go through. Father, we thank you for your word that is true. We thank you for your word and the, the promises that are in there, the promises that say you will never leave us nor forsake us, the promises that say you are listening when we cry out to you. And Father God, you, you see us here today. You see the struggles that we are facing, whether they're physical struggles or emotional struggles or spiritual struggles or anything else. God, you see our struggles, you understand what we are going through. And Father, help us to cry out to you. As we cry out to you, God, we know that you will answer. And for our brothers and sisters today around the world, help them too to cry out to you, to not lose faith, to not lose heart when it gets tough, but to continue to cry out to you, and God, we know for certain that as we cry out to you in prayer, you will answer. Thank you that you have answered our prayers. Thank you that you are going to answer our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.